Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it's Tuesday morning, October 25th, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. And uh, ready to study. We're going to finish up our study today, I think, on premillennialism. I didn't have any further questions. I told you told you all yesterday, if you had anything further that you'd like to discuss on this topic, let's do it. But then I had one more thought in mind that we would study. Uh, that's what we're going to do today. And so... Uh, Got a PowerPoint ready, and we'll well we'll wrap it up today. So we've studied a lot on this particular topic. Well, hold on a second. Let me see who we've got. We, let's let's see who we've got with us today. Diana, Lyle, Marisa. Good morning, Jean, Gail, Michelle. I see Norma over on the Near Churches page. We've got others on the stream. If you have any questions or comments while we're going through this, feel free to use the comment section. And I will acknowledge it when I see it. All right, so today we are going to talk about something that is important in this subject that's connected with premillennialism because, again, part of the, part of the um, doctrine, the belief in premillennialism, is that when Jesus comes back to earth, the Battle of Armageddon, which once it's won, hey, good morning, Patrice, once he has won the Battle of Armageddon, his kingdom will be established all the Jews will be converted to Christ and they will return to Palestine because, they say, the land promised to Abraham was never fulfilled. So that's what I want us to talk about today. Michelle and Connie, good to see you guys. <coughs> so, this, it's kind of, this is one of those topics that when you search the scriptures on it, it's very plain, just like these other things we've been talking about. Some of it's more difficult to understand than others. This is not one of those difficult topics. So we're going to look at it today and uh, answer these questions that, that folks have about it, about the Jews being returned to Palestine and all being converted to Christ. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 12. I'm not going to have the text up on the screen. I'll just use my own Bible here because I've got the PowerPoint up there for, for those who see. And some of you have requested my PowerPoints, my notes. And if you want those, let me know, and I'll be happy to email it to you. Um... And it'll, well, everything that you've seen throughout this series of videos will be included on that uh, PowerPoint. Genesis chapter 12, you know, we're introduced to Abram, Abram, by the way, Abraham later, in at the end of Genesis chapter 11, beginning really in verse 26. Uh, he's the son of Terah, and he has brothers. But you get to Genesis chapter 12, and we are... Uh, what we, we read about these promises that God made to Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. So there's your command. Now in connection with that command were some promises made, and that's what we're going to consider. Here's number one. To a land that I will show you. And, well, there's, there's going to be a promise made to him. Now the command is, Leave to this land that I will show you. That's a command. I will make of you a great nation. There's a promise. I will bless you and make your name great. There's a promise. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you have commands and you have promises. You get down. So he does that. Verse 4, Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and, and Lot went with him. He's 75 years old when he departed from Haran. <clears throat> So I'll go ahead and pop this up on the screen here. I have a map here of the journeys of Abraham. And this is strictly in Canaan, as you see here. Uh, Canaan and Egypt. Of course, he comes from, from east, uh, from the east, all right? Ur of the Chaldees, as it's called. So you get down to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, so he, he makes the journey, he goes where God tells him to go. To your descendants, listen to the text here. Because, again, the promise, uh, the, the claim made by premillennialism is that the promise to Abraham for the land was never fulfilled. Listen to what the Bible says here. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. That's Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. He was commanded to leave his father's house, leave his country, specifically for the reason uh, or, or stated purpose, to a land that I will show you. Okay, so he does that. Good morning, Brian. Good to see you. He does precisely what God says do. And then when he gets there, God says, 
I will give this land to your descendants. And there he, Abraham, built an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him, and he moved from there and went to the mountains east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. So if you're looking at this map here, and this, this may be harder for you to see, it's easier for me to see because it's right in front of my face. Bethel and Ai are right here, right next to the, just west of the Jordan River. Um, you might just estimate it about halfway between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. This is where Abraham comes upon God's command to leave his father's house and go unto this land that I will show you. So, all right, he's done what God said do, and God's going to give this land to his descendants. So Abraham journeyed. All right, so th that's what we have so far. Good morning, Anna. God told him what to do, and he made him some promises based on his obedience to what God told him to do. So, you again, you turn just a few pages, you, you just trace the life of Abraham, and it covers from Genesis 11, again, about verse 26, and his death is recorded in Genesis 25. So, you know, not a great deal of time in the book of Genesis. Um, the life that's covered mostly in the book of Genesis is the life of Joseph. He starts in chapter 37, goes all the way, well, in fact, into Exodus chapter 1 to an extent. But you, you trace Abraham's journeys and his life, uh, you know, again, based on this map, he's here. He goes to Egypt for a short period of time, um, and that's recorded for us in Genesis chapter 12, right where we were just reading. But then he comes right back to the, to the land where he was told to go, that God said, I will give to your descendants, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Well, you get to Genesis chapter 15, and the Lord appears to Abram again and makes him uh, some promises. We're going to start, for what we're talking about here today in regard to the promised land, we're going to start in Genesis 15 and verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, No, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. Now, of course, knowing the biblical text, you know that that's a reference to Egyptian captivity. They're going to be there for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And God did that. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace you shall be buried at a good old age. And again, that's recorded in Genesis 25, his death. But in the fourth generation, here we go again, they, Abraham's descendants, shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down. Well, anyway, the, the event there continues. But the point is this. You get down to the end of verse 18, or rather, all of verse 18, I guess. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, if you want to write a verse next to that one, right next to Genesis chapter 15 and verse, verse 18, write down 1 Kings 4.21, because that tells us when Solomon was king, the extent of his kingdom, and it matches up with this. The point I'm making here is the promise was given to Abraham. You, you leave your father, leave your country. You go to this land that I'll show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will give this land to your descendants, Genesis 12, 7. I'll give it to your descendants after 400 years of Egyptian captivity, Genesis 15, and they're going to inherit the land. So one of the problems with this doctrine of premillennialism is that they have the wrong emphasis on the land promise. Abraham went there and he dwelt there. But the promise for them inheriting the land was to his descendants after the Egyptian captivity. We have to keep that in mind. So the next text is just, well, maybe they're on the same opening. Genesis 16 and verse 3. You know, God had promised him a son. It's been 10 years, no son yet. So this is where uh, Sarai and Abram decide to... Uh, uh, decide to help God out a bit, let's say. So she gives him Hagar. Uh, Genesis 16, 3. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to his wife. Listen, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he's there. He's Again, he's done what God told him to do. Good morning, Billy. Good to see you. He's in the land. 
Okay? I mean, that's just indisputable, indisputable from the biblical text. You go to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 8, and this is another, um, th- this is a, the covenant of circumcision given to Abraham here by God, the sign, okay? And of course, this went on into the nation of Israel uh, with the Jews. But anyway, Genesis 17, 8, also, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan in everlasting possession, and I will be their God. We're going to come back to that idea of the land being an everlasting possession because there is more that Scripture says on that. What does everlasting mean? So, um, again, he's in the land. The promise is continued here. You get to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now, I'll just do this real quick. If you go back to this map, Mamre is right down here by Hebron. It's just west of the Dead Sea. Um, Mamre is basically between Hebron and Jerusalem. So when he, when he left his father's country, he came and dwelt between Bethel and Ai, right here. Well, he's been in the land for 10 years or more now, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 18, and he's dwelling in Mamre, just north of Hebron. He's in the land, okay? I would say God has kept his promise to Abram. So we get to Genesis chapter 18, um, turn a few pages to Genesis chapter 23, and again, we're just, we're just, we're following the biblical text here. I'm not looking for a doctrine. I'm following the biblical text of, of this discussion, the, the promise in regard to this land. Genesis, and this is actually something I did quite a few years ago in my own personal studies, putting this together. Genesis 23, verses 19 and 20. Okay, Abram, uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, dies. Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of Machpelah before Mamre. And I just showed you where that is. It's before Hebron. It, or, that is Hebron. It's in the same region right there. In the cave that is uh, in the land, well, it's in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. He's in the land. He's been living there for years. And now he's bought a piece of property from some people who owned it prior so that he could bury his wife there. He's in the land. All right, all of those promises to Abraham were fulfilled. Leave your father's house, Ur of the Chaldees, and go to this land that I will show you because, Genesis 12, 7, I'm going to give it to your descendants. Genesis 15, 12 through 16, I'm going to give it to them after 400 years of captivity in Egypt. All right, so... Is there anything else that would help us in the book of Genesis see this promise? Okay, yes. Just, I mean, that's the thing. One of the things that maybe you've seen throughout this series of studies on premillennialism is that the Bible, the Bible explains itself. It's not trying to trick you. It's not, you don't have to have a secret decoder ring to know what the Bible means, what it's saying. So Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. You get to Genesis 26, beginning in verse 2. The Lord appeared to him, all right, to Isaac. Don't go to Egypt. Stay in this land. Dwell in this land, verse 3. And I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands. God says the same thing to Isaac that he said to Abraham. And we saw Abraham, throughout the text, living in the land. I will make your descendants multiply, verse 4, as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Of course, that seed promise, um, you know, initially given to Abraham in Genesis 12, it's now extended to Isaac. That's Jesus. All you have to do is read Genesis 3.16. Nope, I'm sorry. Galatians 3.16. Galatians 3.16, and that seed is Christ. That promise was given to Abraham, just like the land promise. That promise was given to Isaac, just like the land promise. Well, you turn to Genesis chapter 18. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 28. Jacob has, or Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob. Genesis 28, 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, this is a, a vision that Jacob has had. We call it Jacob's ladder, all right? I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. He said that to Abraham, he said it to Isaac, and now he said it to Jacob. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, 
Uh, you shall spread about to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and all your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's the seed. That's the Christ promise right there. So you've got the land promise, you've got the great nation promise, and you've got the seed, which is the Christ promise. All of these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The question is, in, in one of the passages we read, I can't remember which verse it is now, I think it's Genesis seventeen eight. I will give this land to you as an everlasting possession. Well, the, the question is, and then in terms of premillennialism is, well, they don't have it now. Um, so they're going to get it one day, and that one day, premillennialism says, is when Christ comes back to earth and reigns in Palestine. That's when all the Jews are going to be returned to the land, and this promise is going to be realized. You, The only way you can come to that conclusion is if you're married to a particular doctrine instead of just investigating to see what the Bible says. Does the Bible say that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all of their descendants, which of course becomes the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, would they receive that land that God initially promised Abram back in Genesis 12? Would they receive that without condition and be able to stay there forever without condition? The answer to that question is no. Okay, so time passes, obviously. Now we're in the days of no, uh, Moses and his leadership of Israel. Um, this is right before Moses' death, in, uh, recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 34. But what we have in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is called the chapter of blessing and cursing. All right, if you want my blessing, if you want to remain in the land, if you want to be fruitful and multiply and have everything you need, you just do what I say. And basically, that's Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14. Verses 15 through the end of the chapter, verse 68 is, if you do not keep my words, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to, be, you're not going to multiply. Your vineyards are not going to produce. You're going to have enemies. It, it's not going to go well for you. The land promise to the Israelite nation was not unconditional. They had to keep God's word. And see, that's, that's another thing. This is not just about a land inheritance. All of these promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of them ultimately are pointing to Christ. See, that's what this is all about. This is not about a piece of land somewhere that people sometime in the future are going to get when Jesus supposedly comes back to the earth. You're missing the, those folks who believe this are missing the point. This is about redemption and salvation and Christ. The land was involved, yes. But it wasn't an unconditional promise. So you start reading, for instance, in Deuteronomy 28 and verse... Man, there's just so much. Verse 58. If you do not carefully observe all the words of the law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues. Um, let's see. Verse 64, Deuteronomy 28, 64. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there, there you shall serve other gods, which neither you uh, nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest. Okay? Captivity will come. Well, again, if you're, if you're just a Bible student, you're not looking for a particular doctrine. What do you see happen in the Bible? Well, the, f the first question is, okay, did they ever receive the land? Well, the answer, to, the answer to that question, again, is in the Bible, and it's yes, and it's repeatedly yes. All right, so jo Joshua 21, 43. Joshua, of course, succeeded, succeeded Moses in the leadership of Israel, Joshua's responsibility, you know, Moses got them to the border of the promised land. Moses was forbidden from entering the promised land because of his sin of striking the rock. Um, Joshua was to take them in to, and to conquer the land. And, and that's the thing. You know, from, from the beginning of Israel as a nation, from the time they left Egypt, if I, if I remember correctly, as the book of Numbers records this after their departure, it took them like two months to start complaining. As, as they're wandering through the wilderness after 400 years of captivity. But um, Joshua is now the leadership. And the book of Joshua is called the book of conquests because what it records for us is 
Israel crossing the Jordan River, going into the Promised Land. The first place they go is Jericho. They conquer Jericho. They go to Ai. They failed at first to conquer Ai because of Achan's sin. This is Joshua chapter 7. They, have, they end up doing that, and the land is conquered and divided. So you get to the end of Joshua, Joshua 21, 43. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land. Okay, <laughs> did, God, <laughs> did God keep his promise to the nation of Israel? So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. Who were the fathers of Israel? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around, according to all that he had sworn to their father. So again, right there. So notice the word all. It keeps appearing in these three verses here. All right? All the land that he had sworn to give to their fathers, not a man of all their enemies uh, stood against them. For the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Listen to this, uh, Joshua twenty-one forty-five. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel, all came to pass. Notice the repetition of that word all. He gave them all the land. All of their enemies were defeated. All good things came to pass. They inherited the land. We already know that that land promise was not unconditional. They had to keep the word. They had, they had to keep obedience to God if they were going to stay in the land. Well, you turn a couple pages, Genesis 23 Genesis. Joshua 23, uh, verse 14. This is right before Joshua dies. He says, Behold, this day I'm going all the way, I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts. Okay, again, pay attention to the word all here. Every one of you knows this. In all your hearts, in all your souls, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God has spoken concerning you. All has come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Did the Israelites, did the Jewish people receive the land that God promised Abraham? Yes, not one word failed. And then you get to Joshua 24 and verse 13. I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. It's, it's happened. It's a reality. We know, okay, so Joshua, you turn in your Bible to the book of Judges. The book of Judges covers about 400 years or so uh, and leads us ultimately into the monarchy because you have uh, Eli and Samuel there at the end, particularly Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's when the Israelites said, you know, basically we're tired of the period of, this, of the judges. We want a king to judge us like all the nations. So you have Saul, of course, David, which we've talked a lot about, and Solomon. After Solomon's death, the kingdom split into two, northern Israel, southern Israel. And the nation of Israel, northern Israel, fell first to the Assyrians. Southern Israel, Judah, fell to the Babylonians. But all of this is connected to that land promise and the conditional nature of them remaining in the land. So I'm going to take my Bible over to Jeremiah chapter 29 real quick. I know we've kind of jumped a bit here going from Joshua to Jeremiah, but Jeremiah is a captivity prophet. And remember what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you fail to keep my words, you're going to be scattered among nations. You won't know their language. You won't know their gods. But you're not going to be in this land anymore because you failed to keep my covenant. Well, that's where we are in Jeremiah's day. The people have become unfaithful. Jeremiah 29.10 for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. And you can really, I mean, really, you can read down through verse 14. So they have the land. They're taken into Babylon for 70 years. While they're in Babylon, God says, I will bring you back to this land. All right. Again, the question being, did God keep his promise? Were they returned to the land after their captivity. Uh, yes, two verses, and we'll actually look at another one here in just a minute, but Ezra chapter 2 and verse 70, this is post-Babylonian captivity. The priests and the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim dwelt in their cities, and all Israel and their cities. 
Nehemiah 7.73 says the exact same thing. All Israel dwelt in their cities. So, I'm going to turn over to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. And, uh, of course, Nehemiah is doing his work after Babylonian captivity. The, the city has been rebuilt. Jerusalem, the walls have been rebuilt. The temple, all of that's been going on. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees, that's Genesis chapter 12, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give him, all right, listen to this, to, you made a covenant to give him the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. And see, that's key. Who did God promise to give it to back all the way back in Genesis chapter 12? Abraham, leave your father, leave his country, and go to a land that I will show you. Because, Genesis 12, 7, I'm going to give it to your descendants. So, that's exactly what we're reading here in Nehemiah chapter 9, and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. Listen to Nehemiah 9, 8. You have performed your words. Now, that. To me, the most important part of this verse is the very last phrase of this. You have performed your words. Look, for you are righteous. If God had not kept the land promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then to the nation at large, if he had not kept that promise, he would not be righteous. But he did. And all of this that we're reading, this is past tense. You did that. Because you are righteous. And this is one of the big problems of premillennialism. God is not a righteous God under that scheme, under that belief system. Because remember, you know, the first time Jesus came, he was going to set up a kingdom, but he got rejected. And so God had to set up the church to stand in the place of the kingdom until Jesus comes back. Well, if that's the case, then God's not righteous there either. Because the Old Testament tells us that he would be rejected by men. Isaiah 53 Psalm 89, um, the, the, the stone that would become the, key, the chief corner was rejected. It, it was no surprise. So one of, the major, one of the major flaws of premillennialism, and there are many, many major flaws, is dealing with the righteousness of God. The land promise was made and reiterated time and time again, and Nehemiah and actually, uh, this prayer here in, ne in Nehemiah chapter 9 is the prayer of the, um, of the Levites, kind of like a prayer of national confession and repentance. They said, you have done all this because you are righteous. Premillennialism turns God into an unrighteous God. The land promised to Abraham and his descendants was not unconditional. They had to keep the covenant, and they didn't. And so they were taken from the land. They were restored, and they rebuilt the city, and they, they rebuilt the temple. All the promises have been fulfilled. The hope of Israel today, if you want to read about the hope of Israel today, you need to read Paul's um, defenses before, who is it, Felix and Agrippa. Like Read Acts chapters 24 through 26. The hope of Israel is not a land inheritance sometime in the future. The hope of Israel is the resurrection from the dead because of Jesus Christ. So premillennialism even has a false hope. There, there, are so many, there, there are so many folks who hold to this doctrine and so many religious groups who hold to it who I don't think really grasp the, um, the, the full implications of everything this doctrine says. I think that's a good way to put it. Premillennialism says God is not righteous because Nehemiah says, you kept all your word, you gave them the land, for you are righteous. That's it. God's either righteous or he isn't. And he gave them the land because he is righteous. There, there's no future land inheritance coming for Israel. It, it's done. The, the, the promises have been kept. Even the seed promise, obviously, again, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, the promise that through Abraham's seed, all nations would be blessed. Well, that's what Jesus, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So it, it, it's a, it's a premillennialism is a doctrine based on false hope, on incorrect methods of Bible study, 
I mean, there's so many problems with this doctrine that are so easily seen if you just are a careful reader of the Bible. But anyway, so I think this makes 13 videos. I've got them numbered on the on our YouTube channel, but I think this is number 13. Like I said, I hope this study's been helpful to you. Um, I haven't received any requests for Bible studies, you know, what you want to do next. So my plan is just to go on to 1 Peter. We only lack a couple of books to complete an entire study of the New Testament on our YouTube channel. So I think we're going to start 1 Peter. I don't know if I'm going to start it tomorrow, though. I may not do anything tomorrow on the live stream. But All right, guys, I guess that's it. I appreciate you being here today. And uh, let's, let's plan on not having a live stream tomorrow. We may just start back Monday. I think I think that's what we'll do. Let's just start let's plan on starting back Monday and we're going to start in the book of 1 Peter on Monday. All right guys. Thank you. Uh, map studies would be a good subject. Yeah, absolutely. Bible geography, absolutely. That's a very valuable study. Maybe more valuable than people re really do realize because there's so many places talked about and uh, and and archaeology would be good too. So all right, guys, thanks again for being here today, and, uh, well, I guess we'll see you Monday. So, have a good day.